Lovecraft ended the first portion of the story with a hook, innuendo to let the reader wonder what had happened at the camp and what it was that convinced Dyer that people could never know about what he and Danforth saw in the mountains that threatened the world. The next part then begins by filling in more of the details of just how horrific things were in the camp, and as you probably noted, left little room for doubt that the Elder Ones that Lake had uncovered had not been dead, but preserved these millions of years and had awakened in the 24-hour daylight of the Antarctic summer. The behavior described, while horrific to consider, indicates that the Elder Ones may have reacted with what we'd consider savagery, but afterwards had conducted themselves with clear intelligence, both in burying their dead with ceremony and in conducting a scientific investigation of where they had found themselves. But for Dyer, the answer to what had happened would likely be in those mountains, which he and Danforth alone would visit in order to avoid being too heavy for the plane to reach. Their aerial view shows an impossibly intricate set of carved stone, and though Dyer admits that they wanted to assume that it was somehow a natural development, the use of architectural techniques such as the arch makes clear that this couldn't have happened by accident. As a geologist, Dyer goes into great detail about the nature of the stones that they were able to see, a detail that Lovecraft uses to remind us that we are dealing with a scientist here, someone who thus is accustomed to considering new possibilities in the face of new evidence, and yet even he struggles to accept what he sees with his own eyes. They find a place to land the plane and equipped with just about everything that they could need for a careful investigation to again make clear we are not dealing with amateurs stumbling into things, but scientists who plan ahead. Which is good because this is a much grander undertaking than even they could have imagined. Lovecraft spends this portion of the book on Revelation. There is no intention to terrify, only, at most, to unsettle, as he reveals the details about the Elder Ones, gleaned by Dyer and Danforth from what they find within the city. For starters, the Elder Ones were the first to arrive on Earth, coming here a billion years ago and long before all the other aliens started ruining the neighborhood. The Elder Ones, were told, were highly advanced beings, creating the first life on Earth, from which all life is now descended. And there's a reason for this. Lovecraft is a much-considered figure, recognized as being deeply imaginative, while also flawed as a human being. He believed a number of things over the course of his life, including the previously mentioned and notorious racist tendencies, which were strong opinions even for his time, though he seemed to mellow with age and is said to have admitted in later life that he had been a bit thick on the subject. He also for a time believed that both Marxism and democracy were systems doomed to failure and that a hereditary aristocracy should instead lead, though it seems this may have likewise been a phase that he left behind, given that he was also considered a Roosevelt New Dealer and developed warm feelings about socialism. We hear a lot about Lovecraft because so much of what the man thought throughout his entire life has been recorded for posterity, whereas no one knows what stupid ideas other celebrated figures may have held at some point. It wasn't like today where every thought you've ever had is wound up on Facebook or Twitter. None of this is to make excuses for Lovecraft. Like I mentioned with the shadow over Innsmouth, Discussing it is necessary not to excuse his views, but rather to understand how and why they influence his writings, as much as his keen interest in science influenced what we discussed in Part 1, and how his love for Poe influences events which we'll get into in Part 3. It's for this reason that we should note that Lovecraft held three relevant beliefs throughout much of his life, the first being that the purpose of society and the government was the development of high aesthetic and intellectual standards. The second, that the West was in the midst of a decline, that civilizations follow life cycles like humans, and his time was one of decay and degeneration, in keeping with the views of the contemporary Oswald Spengler. And finally, that what is ideal for society is a hierarchical structure with those who merit being on the top being elevated and the other, lessers, be kept in line and do as they're told. Thus, what Lovecraft presents in The Elder Ones is a society that demonstrates these points. The first point is shown repeatedly through reference to their culture and history. The Elder Ones, for example, keep things away from the walls so as to be able to cover the walls in murals, 
and their artistic skills are praised repeatedly. They're also shown to be highly intelligent, both in their great scientific knowledge and in their chosen means of using it, avoiding the pitfalls that such science created for the decaying West. They are, of course, socialists, though even Dyer must admit that this is conjecture, and their method of reproduction removes the need for familial connection and thus leaving everybody free to form a family with those that are like-minded rather than merely having genetic commonality. In short, the Elder One's culture was entirely respectable and indeed to be admired. This goes so far as to reveal that it is not the Elder Ones that have Dyer so terrified. While it is true that they, in fact, were responsible for the slaughter at the camp, Dyer dismisses the action as understandable behavior under the circumstances. That to awaken like that, perhaps being attacked by the dogs and then followed by the terrified men, would drive them to fight in perceived, or actual, self-defense, and that the post-mortem behavior merely indicates scientific curiosity. He even believes that, should they encounter those particular elder ones or others, that a logical, civilized being would recognize that they were not a threat and wouldn't harm them or at the very least recognize their value as living examples of their species. It's almost mind-splitting to see how much Lovecraft on the one hand treats those who killed and butchered all those men and look completely inhuman, saying that they are in the end men, while viewing others of his own species as being subhuman, despite clearly having more in common with Lovecraft than his fictitious elder ones. But the reasoning will be relevant later on. As for point two, the Elder One Society existed since a billion years ago. Thus, over their long, long history, Lovecraft saw an inevitable decline. A decline not only for the Elder One Society, where the word decadent and its derivatives are used dozens of times, but even showing signs that their very biology was becoming less sophisticated over time, reflecting their social implosion in their physicality. This descent was likely accelerated by the wars the Elder Ones fought against other alien colonists, the Cthulhu Spawn, and the Migo. As for the third point, the enlightened Elder Ones, with their incredible knowledge, created their own servant class to meet their needs. This is the Shagoth, an amorphous blob that could take whatever form was required for the task at hand, such as constructing underwater cities for the Elder Ones. While the Elder Ones are thoroughly alien in appearance, they are understandable. There is a logical basis to their biology. The Shagoths, on the other hand, being the lesser race, are not only mindless, but formless, hideous. In their default state, a mass of eyes, mouths, and tentacles. The Elder Ones are on the top of society, and it's the role of the Shagoths to allow them to continue to leave this idyllic lifestyle in the pursuit of intellect and art. In short, while the Elder Ones are a powerful species who once used a pre-Simian creature for food and entertainment, though they seem to especially prefer penguins, the only threat that they might pose is that they are so beyond us that we might still be considered inferiors to be exploited. But that would be a worst-case scenario, and Dyer doesn't even entertain it. Yet he is adamant about the horror of what they have found here. We'll get into that in our final look at the Mountains of Madness.